Um, and thank you everybody for attending this morning's session. As Amir mentioned, uh, today's topic is an overview of master planning in Dynamics AX. This is going to be a, an introduction to the subject, so typically geared towards um, perhaps new users to AX or even existing users um, in other AX modules that uh, are interested in gaining some exposure to, to the functionality within master planning and as well even um, users who are, are simply evaluating and, and looking to learn a little bit more uh, about the AX system. Um, the agenda today will focus primarily on the scope of master planning within Dynamics AX. We're going to talk about the overview and purpose of the function sort of in a general context and then more specifically within an AX context. We'll talk about some of the dependencies and integration of the module with other AX functions and modules. And there are a couple of key business processes within inside the module that we're really going to focus on. Um, those being distribution requirements planning, material requirements planning, and then planning for capacity in order to support production activity. Um, we'll follow that up um, with a little bit of additional uh, discussion on inventory policies and their relationship to planning. And we'll look at some of the ways those inventory policies um, influence uh, the execution of those three um, requirements planning functions. Um, and then lastly, we'll add some demand to the mix and look at the way um, those planning functions in incorporate demand into the equations as well. Um, a little bit about our Bella Technologies. We're a, a, a Microsoft Gold partner. Uh, we've been in the channel since 2004. We were founded in 2002 um, by um, industry veterans with a lot of ERP and supply chain experience, and including a couple of people who were on the original um, development team of the uh, exact application prior to the purchase by Microsoft. Our, our offices are located in Southern California with regional offices in the Atlanta area of the UK and Denmark. And we are um, a, a, broad, um, a, a broad service provider in the Microsoft channel. Our, our focus tends to be on manufacturing clients, and we'll look at some of the different industries that we support here in just a minute. Um, a, a little bit about awards and recognitions so that, that we've received. We're Microsoft Gold certified, uh, certified in, um, in enterprise resource planning, uh, competency winner, members of TAP and the partner advisory board, so we're on the early adoption program for um, AX7. Um, uh, again, we're, we're, we're a, we tend to be a manufacturing heavy focus. Um, these are just a few of the industries where we have got some, where we, we've done uh, the, a, a good deal of our work with some of our larger clients. Um, you know, these industries spanning process manufacturing to discrete and complex manufacturing and aerospace, building materials, um, tech and regulated environments as well. Um, and we, you can see some of our uh, client lists there at the bottom of this screen. Um, as I mentioned, we're a full service shop. AX is, uh, is sort of the cornerstone of what we do. We've also got a, a large and growing CRM practice, um, as well as other support services for upgrade and, and, and project rescue. Um, and we offer um, uh, uh, standard support services, 24 hours available standard support, as well as 24 by 7 on an as-needed basis um, in a full range of uh, training services on the applications that we support as well. If there's any additional information that you'd like on our support or other services, um, feel free to contact us, and I'll show some contact information at the, at the close of this presentation. Um, with that, I'd like to jump into the topic, the introdu introduction to master planning and dynamics AX. So we'll, we'll start with just some general concept. We, you know, what is master planning and how does it relate to dynamics AX? Master planning as a function is what we do to allow companies to determine and balance future need for manufactured products, purchase materials, and capacity to meet company goals. Those goals being typically to support customer demands. Um, what the master planning process specifically does is assess what's required to satisfy customer demand. And the underlying assumption there is that we've got some ability to project or either um, manage a backlog of customer demand. Uh, what's currently available to respond to those demands, both in terms of finished goods inventory, raw materials inventory, production resources or capacity to execute production. And, and from that, what actions are necessary to balance the supply with the demand. 
In other words, what, what must be manufactured? What do we need to purchase? What do we need to set aside as inventory? What do we need to move out to distribution locations in order to best satisfy those customer requirements? Um, several inputs to the master planning calculations. And master planning in AX and any other system is typically a highly integrated module. Um, a lot of the parameter settings are drawn from elsewhere in the system, and a lot of the transaction data is drawn from elsewhere, other modules inside of the AX system as well. Um, the integration in AX includes, but is not limited to, just some of the primary ones, organization administration. So, for example, where we set up all our production resources, human resources and machine resources, uh, the product information module, um, all of our engineering data is maintained there, planning parameters, supplier defaults, you know, customer, uh, you know, sales defaults and things of that nature. Uh, the transactions themselves coming out of the sales and marketing module uh, for orders and order dates, the procurement and sourcing module for PO, uh, you know, raw material and component supply, and the production order both for scheduled receipts and also scheduled activity that is going to consume um, lower level component and raw materials. Um, and then lastly, the inventory, mo the inventory module and the warehouse management module where we maintain things like inventory, current inventory positions, inventory statuses, um, location data, and other parameters related to site and warehouse and location that can influence the way we, we plan our materials. Given the, the integrated nature of the module, we've got a few prerequisites um, to effective planning. And again, these apply to specific, specifically to AX we're talking about here, but really any system where you're running MRP or any other type of planning function. Um, first and foremost, we've got to have accurate inventory. The quantities that we, have on, that we say we have on hand have to be accurate. The status of those materials. Do we have non-conforming material? Do we have quarantine material and things of that nature? That's got to be accurate and it's got to be timely. The locations where that material is stored have also got to be accurate as well in order for the planning functions to properly calculate uh, requirements. Um, we've got to have accurate transaction data. And specifically, I'm talking about sales orders, purchase orders, and production orders. Uh, the dates and the quantities on all of those transactions have to be, uh, again, timely and accurate. So if I've got a purchase order receipt scheduled for a certain date, um, I learn that it's not going to arrive on that date, but I don't update that purchase order in a timely manner. From a planning perspective, the planning function believes that material is going to arrive on that date. It doesn't know otherwise until we adjust that date, and until those dates are accurate, we're at risk of, of producing either an unworkable um, or, or an inefficient plan. Um, so again, timely process of transactions, posting the consumption when it's used, posting material usage, posting material arrivals and, and receipts when they're, you know, when they're received from suppliers or completed in the production process. And if we have non-conformance, scrap, and other inventory adjustments and other inventory movements, we've got to post those in a timely manner when they're moved so that the system can calculate based on the most current and most accurate data. Um, also, uh, planning parameter setup becomes critical. Lead times, lot sizes, and replenishment policies, in other words, how and at what interval are we going to replenish, those have got to be um, set based on reality as well. So, for example, if we expect it to take two weeks to receive a raw material from a supplier, that's got to be represented in the system somehow so the system can allow, so the calculations can allow um, for that time buffer in their, in their planning calculations. And we'll look at each of those as we, we go a little bit further through the process. So let's talk about master planning. And I'm going to talk in, initially from a general context, and then we'll move into AX. This is a mani manufacturing planning and control hierarchy that is adapted from a, from a classic text, manufacturing planning and control systems, which has been in the um, APEX library for 30 plus years, it's been adapted over time to you know, reflect some of the new things in technology and some new methods. But essentially what we're looking at here is from a, from a, from a planning hierarchy standpoint, we've got business planning functions, which are typically your longer range planning functions. And let's just say generally um, those are, those, that's a planning horizon that goes out you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of five years. Typically our projections for business planning are revenue-based, cost-based, so when we measure 
um, the, the the planning units at that level of planning, we're typically talking about dollars and over a longer horizon. As, as we move down in the hierarchy to a sales and operations planning level, typically we're looking at product lines or families of products um, that are going to support that long-range financial plan. And as we begin to talk about product lines and product categories, we can begin to envision things like what types of resources are going to be um, necessary in order to execute those plans. You know, so broader range plant, plant capacity, the types of plants, the types of equipment that we use, um, uh, you know, perhaps even you know, subcontract, uh, subcontractors in order to facilitate those plans based on the, the, the product families and the broader range types of products that we're working with. As we move down into this shaded area, now we're really getting into the scope of master planning inside of the AX system. Um, beyond sales and operations planning, we typically move down into a product specific or an end item or, or SKU based method of planning. When we start to look at what the demand projections are and what the distribution requirements are for specific products in specific locations. Um, based on demand um, and based on inventory policies, we begin to think about what do we need to do from a production scheduling process? What specific end items do we need to make and upon which schedule in order to meet those, um, uh, those customer demands? Um, and then from there, what manufacturing resources at a rough cut level? Generally, what, what overall volume am I going to produce? And, and from there, what do I need to do in terms of specific machinery um, and, and specific uh, labor resources um, at, a, at a broader level? As we get down to the ex closer to the execution stage, we translate those into specific assembly schedules, specific order releases um, for finished goods. From a material requirements planning standpoint, we begin to calculate in order to support though that final assembly schedule based on the master production schedule, what raw material components do I need and when do I need to order them? And then from, from, a, from a detailed capacity requirements planning standpoint, we begin to look at what um, time do I need to allocate on specific, you know, in specific uh, manufacturing resource groups at specific periods of time. And ultimately that will feed the manufacturing execution process, also supported by AX and the ERP environment, but we're not really going to get too much into manufacturing execution today, where our focus is really going to be in the shaded area on those activities that are, um, that are supported by, by master scheduling. So taking a different view of that same hierarchy, and I'm really kind of just reordering the view inside of that shaded area, um, I want to look at the distribution requirements planning function. So on the, on the left, um, I've indicated the direction of demand flow. So typically from customers through the distribution network to the production facility, and then based on our material uh, our material requirements and our capacity capacity requirements, it, it will flow down certainly to material suppliers and possibly even to subcontract production resources. On the right side, then, we've got the direction of the physical flow of material from supplier um, upstream to the customer network. So those gold bars are the three functions, uh, DRP, MRP, and CRP, that we're going to look at with inside of, of AX. Okay, so just a couple of notes on distribution requirements planning. Typically, we're talking about planning at a finished goods inventory level. This is going to be driven by distribution center stocking policies, inventories, sales forecasts, or customer orders. And we'll look at a couple of examples of distribution models and how they'd be represented in AX. Um, distribution network requirements become demands to be included in master production scheduling. So whatever I need to stock out in our distribution centers or, or whether I'm shipping it directly to customers, um, that really becomes the, the, the key input to our master production schedule. And from an AX perspective, what we'll see is that, that those planned activities will drive replenishment or transfer orders inside of AX for fulfillment to any distribution site from our, from our key manufacturing sites. So let's take a look at a, you know, a fairly simple model. Starting from the bottom, I've got a production facility. That production facility supports two different regional distribution centers. And each of those regional distribution centers supports some number of remote satellite warehouses. So I've got my direction of demand flow from satellite warehouses, those closest to customer, all the way into the manufacturing facility. And I'm going to move material from the manufacturing facility through the distribution network to, to get inventory out to those stocking facilities to support customer demand. 
Okay, so I've got eight facilities there. The way I would represent that in AX for a given product is that I've got a manufacturing site called MFG1, and my fulfillment method of that product in the manufacturing site is a planned order type of production. Um, then I've got my two DCs, um, and those are going to be filled by transfers, in this case from the manufacturing site. And then I've got my five satellite warehouses, and those are going to be filled by transfers from the designated DCs. So the first three warehouses are going to be pulling from the first distribution center. The second uh, two warehouses are going to be pulling from the second distribution center. We'll talk a little bit more in later slides about these minimums, maximums, and coverage, coverage groups. But for this example, I've set this up just on a basic assumption so we can get familiar with the mechanics that says, I want to stock one unit of this finished good item, FG1, in each of these eight facilities. Okay. So given that, and when I run planning, what I see is, I, let's look at the planned orders initially for my five satellite warehouses. I've got uh, a total of five orders, one for each unit that I want to stock in each one of the warehouses. I can see that my warehouse one, warehouse two, and warehouse three have a planned order generated, and those are all going to be fulfilled by transfer from warehouse DC1. And I've got a warehouse four and a warehouse five, again, each with a, a planned transfer order for one unit and those are each going to be filled by DC2. If I move down to the lower half of this pane, I'll see that I've got a series of transfer orders for a total of seven units now. So DC1 is going to pull a unit for the one I want to stock in the DC, plus three more units, one for each of the distribution centers that are going to be full, filled out of that DC1. And then likewise, DC2 has got three, one for the unit that we're going to stock in DC2, and one for each of the two units that we're going to support out of DC2, um, the, the satellite warehouses that we're going to support out of DC2. And in each case, those are pulling directly from the manufacturing uh, facility by transfer. If I go down to the manufacturing facility now, what I see is a series of planned production orders, and I've got eight of them. You know, I've, and again, I've broken these out just so I'm so we can kind of see the mechanics of it. But I've got eight orders: one for the one I want to stock in the manufacturing facility, one for the two that I'm going to get to each of the DCs, and then five more for the additionals that I'm going to move through the DCs ultimately to move out to satellite warehouses. Okay, so we can set up for a given product. We can set up a, a planning method and a replenishment method based on what our stocking policy is for that item in various locations, whether it's a distribution facility or whether it's a production facility. Okay. Let's take a look at a similar model, but we've got one variation in this case. I've got the same eight facilities, my production facility, my two DCs, and my five satellite warehouses. In this case, I'm filling one of my satellite warehouses directly from my production facility. So, for example, if I've got one, for this product, if I've got one facility that moves this material in sufficient volume, I might decide that I want to forego some of the logistics involved in moving it through distri regional distribution centers, and I want to move directly out to a satellite warehouse. For example, maybe I can fill it in full pallet quantities or full truckload quantities out to that facility. So if we look at the setup for this inside of AX, it's similar. My, my manufacturing site is still being fulfilled by production order. I've still got my two DCs that are being fulfilled from my manufacturing site. Uh, my warehouse one and warehouse two being filled from DC one, my warehouse four and five both being filled from DC two. And in this case, for this item, I've set warehouse three to be fulfilled by transfer directly from the manufacturing facility. Okay, so two different products, same distribution network, um, but at an item level, I can define the replenishment path for um, that, that makes the most sense for each individual item. Okay, so if I look at my distribution orders again, I've got five transfers out to the, each of the remote satellite warehouses. And as you'd expect, one and two are coming from DC1, four and five are coming from DC2. And you can see for warehouse three that that's going to be full, filled by replenishment from, directly from the manufacturing site. If we look at planned orders for the DC, now I've got three into DC1 instead of the four that I had in the other item. Right, one for the item that I want to keep in the DC, and then two, um, one for each of the uh, orders that are going to be, one for each of the, the warehouses that are going to be fulfilled out of the DC, and then uh, DC2 looks just like it did in the other model. 
Um, the manufacturing look is just the same as it was in the other model. I've got a total of eight required to fulfill the distribution network. That hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed in this case is the, the path that I'm using for replenishment. So the total demand on the manufacturing side is the same in this case as it was in the previous case. I want to look at one more variation of the distribution model. And get, I've got the same eight facilities in this case, only in this case I've added a subcontract manufacturer. So my production facility, again, is, is supplying the two DCs, which are in total going to supply um, four of my satellite warehouses. I've got a fifth satellite warehouse, and maybe this is a remote location. And for this pro particular product, there's a... Uh, um, another manufacturer in the area that can produce it on a subcontract basis and deliver it to that satellite warehouse more efficiently than I can get it there, that we can get it there internally um, from our manufacturing facility. So I've got that one set up to be supported by a subcontract facility. Um, so let's look at what the planning setup looks like in AX for this item. So again, I've got my, pr my manufacturing site filled by production. My DCs look just the same. My first four warehouses look just the same. Those are being fulfilled from DCs. My warehouse five in this case is being filled by purchase order, and that purchase order is going to come from my supplier, Subcon 1. Okay. So again, different product, uh, different replenishment path for, for each case. Um, let's just take a quick look at the planned orders that result from this. In this case, I've got four transfer orders. Um, from satellite warehouses, right? One, two, three, and four are being filled through the distribution network from the regional distribution centers. If I look at my DCs, I've got three that are coming out of DC1, three that are coming out of DC2, or through DC1 and through DC2 from the manufacturing site. Okay. If I look at my production activity, in this case, I'm only producing seven. I've got eight um, distribution points in the network that I want to fill, seven of them are going to be filled from the manufacturing sites. So and the manufacturing site, two DCs, and four of the remote warehouses. And in this case, the planning function has generated another type of order, a planned purchase order, in this case for satellite warehouse five, and that's a planned purchase order to come from that subcontract vendor that we've set up for the um, for that facility. Okay, so that's a little bit of an overview of, of of the way of the mechanics behind the way distribution requirements planning works inside of AX. Right, the planning um, convention that we use is we plan per item, and then depending on our site and warehouse and location setup, we've got the ability to plan per item per location. So in this case, up eight different distribution points, and I've looked at a number of different methods that I can use for fulfilling. Um, material requirements, finished good requirements in this case, um, through the uh, through the distribution planning model. Okay, so in each of those cases, what we saw was we had distribution requirements moving out through DCs and moving out through satellite warehouses, and in each case, we saw that there was some load placed on the manufacturing facility. So the manufacturing facility is the key point for fulfilling all of those, and ultimately the demand at each of those remote facilities shows up in the form of a planned production order in the manufacturing facility. So when we move down into this next section of this chart, we're going to look at the two aspects that we've got to consider for how we're going to plan for um, supporting that manufacturing activity. Okay? So specifically, we're going to look at bills of material and its impact on uh, planning the raw materials required to, to meet those production demands. And we're also going to look at manufacturing resources, machines and labor, and talk a little bit about some of the uh, capacity planning conventions that are used there. Okay, so let's talk about material requirements planning. MRP and its key inputs, so production demand. Um, in our example, we've looked at distribution demand and, and really safety stock demand because the the requirements at each of those distribution centers were requirements to stock material. Um, but it can also come from forecasted demand or it can come specifically from sales orders. And we'll take a little bit of a look at, at forecasts as we, we, we move down in the presentation. Um, the other key input is the bill of material. So if I need to produce that item finished good one, I've got to understand what raw materials, what purchase components, what subassembly levels go into that product so that I can plan them appropriately. I've also got to understand what my inventory statuses are. Do I have any of those finished goods on hand to begin with? Do I have any of the raw materials or sub-assemblies on hand to begin with? If I do, do I have reservations against any of those materials? Or do I have materials that are already allocated to 
other distribution orders, other production orders, things of that nature. And again, locations are significant. As we plan from a distribution model, we're planning by location, but also from a production standpoint, if I've got subcontract manufacturing facilities, I may have raw materials in two different warehouses, and I may want, and I may determine that, that I want to limit my planning calculations for material requirements to materials based on specific locations for specific products. Okay. Um, existing transactions are also a key input, so my planned and scheduled receipts and order releases. So if I've got existing POs uh, for raw materials coming in, existing production orders for sub-assemblies to be produced, production orders to consume lower level component parts, um, sales orders, all of those transactions fit, factor in to the MRP equations. And then, as with distribution, the planning parameter. Their stocking policies, lot sizes, and lead times has certainly influenced the, the, the order releases that, um, that are generated out of MRP. Um, key outputs from the MRP process are, are going to be planned production order releases and planned purchase order releases in, in our example here. What do I need to make and what do I need to buy in order to make? Okay, so let's start with, and I diagrammed as simple a multi-level bill as I could come up with, um, which is a finished good, which is made from two components, one sub-assembly, uh, sub-assembly one I call it, and one component, component one I call it. Our sub-assembly is in turn also made from two components, a single raw material and, and an additional component called component two. Okay, so this is a multi-level view of a bill of material. Um, let's look at the way this is represented inside of AX. And again, this is a fairly simple bomb, but if I look at the top half of this screen, I've got my finished goods bomb, FG1, and I can see the two um, components that make it up. Right? I've got my sub-assembly one and my component one, and I'm calling for one each of those to make finished goods one. As sub-assembly one is also a manufactured item, on, and on the lower half of this screen, I've represented the bill of material that's, that is um, that defines subassembly one as well, and it's made from raw material one and uh, and component two. Okay, so those are represented inside of AX as a series of single level bills, um, and then in our bomb designer we can see a nested view of that. Right, so this is just another um, way of looking at that picture that I diagrammed on the first slide. My finished good level, finished good level at the top. My first level of the bill of material is my sub and my component one, and then I've got a second level of the bill of material which is needed to make that sub assembly. <clears throat> okay, so that's the general structure. Let's talk a little bit about how lead time offsetting influences our uh, material requ requirements planning calculation. So again, starting with my finished good one, let's assume that it takes me one week to assemble that finished good one once I've got my two components available. When I go down to the next level of the bill of material, I've got my subassembly one, and the, my assumption is it's going to take me two weeks to assemble that once I've got the components. Um, and then for each of my purchased items, my component one, my component two, and my raw material one, it's going to take one week um, to procure those. So from the time I order to the time I can expect delivery from my supplier, um, I've got one week in the planning horizon. Okay, so the first thing I want to look at here is what is my cumulative lead time? And cumulative lead time is really sort of a critical path concept. If I look at each bill of material, at each level in the bill of material, um, what's the longest lead time that I need to consider? So I've got my one week for finished good one plus my two weeks, the longer of my, my two uh, components at level one on the bill of material, which is also which is two weeks. Um, and then I've got my one week at the third level of the bill of material. My raw material and component each are a week. I take the longer of the two, they're, they're the same. So my critical path is really the one week at the top level, the two weeks at the intermediate level, and then one week at the lowest raw material level. So MRP will plan from top down to determine when we need to release orders based on demand for that product. So let's assume that I've got demand for the finished good in week four, four weeks from today. It's going to back off each of those times and tell me that I need to order my raw material one and component two this week, um, which will uh, plan a scheduled receipt for those materials next week. It's going to tell me that I need to start my sub-assembly one next week, um, and then based on a two weeks lead time, it's going to assume that I can complete production of that sub-assembly three weeks from today. It's going to tell me that I need to order my component one in two weeks. It's also needed three weeks out 
but since it's got a shorter lead time, it's going to tell me that I can release that order uh, two weeks from today. Um, both of those will arrive in three weeks, which is the time that I need to start my finished good, um, and based on its one-week lead time, in order to plan, in order to schedule receipt of that product four weeks from today, and meet the customer demand. So let's look at how we represent this in AX. On the left side of this screen, I've got my default order settings. Um, in the lower right side of each card, I've got my inventory lead time for the two manufactured item, which is seven days for my finished goods and 14 days for my sub-assembly. And then over on the right side, I've got a, a, an order setting card for each of my purchased items, and I've specified purchase lead time on each of those as seven days. Okay. So if I put a demand in the system for four weeks out from today, May 27th, and I run my planning calculation, it generates a series of planned orders based on those offsets that we discussed in the prior screen. So I've got planned purchase orders for my raw material and my component one telling me release today, April 29th, for delivery a week from today. I've got a planned production order for my sub-assembly one, which is saying start on the 6th, finish on the 20th based on the two components that I'm going to receive. I've got my additional component, component one, which is saying purchase on the 13th for receipt on the 20th, and those will all support a May 20th start date for production of my finished good, which will meet my um, demand date of May 27th. Okay. One other view that I want to look at in AX, we've got the ability to look at a, a, a bill of material explosion for any manufactured item. And these are the same planned orders. It really is just a, a top-down rather than a sequential view um, of what we need to order and when. It's a top-down view that shows the dependencies of which drives each piece of demand. Okay. So that's a little bit about the mechanics of the way MRP works. It works the same on a simple two-level bill of material as it does on a complex bill of material that may run six or seven levels deep. We run through iterations. We look at what is needed, how much planning, what's available, how much planning time is going to be required to fill that requirement, and then it will schedule release dates for specific orders and schedule receipt dates receipt dates for those specific orders based on the lead times that we've specified. Okay, So that's material. I want to take a quick look at manufacturing resources. Again, the machines and labor required and because in addition to having material, we've also got to account for um, the machines and people required to put that product together. So let's talk about capacity first. Initially when we talk about capacity, and these are you know, standard APEX definitions. We're talking about the capability of a system to perform an expected function. At, at a more narrow level, we're talking about a capability of a specific worker, a machine, a work center, a plant, or an organization. And typically, that capacity is measured in terms of output per time period. Okay? Uh, the main inputs and variables to capacity planning are a production route. So where we've got a bill of material that specifies what do we need to make something, we've got a production route which um, defines the steps involved from converting those materials at lower levels up into the finished good. Um, and what resources, what machines, what equipment, what people are required to, um, you know, to execute that work. For each of those resources, we also need to know how much time do we have available per resource and how many resources do we have available. And resource efficiency and utilization is also a critical factor. For example, um, for each worker in an eight-hour shift, how much productive time do we realistically think we can get out of each worker? So, for example, if I've got two workers that work each work an eight-hour shift, do I have 16 hours of available capacity, or do I need to account for things like breaks, um, other meetings, other um, priorities that those people might get pulled on, change order times, and things of that nature, all that can... Um, affect the amount of actual uh, production capacity time that we have even in an eight-hour shift. Okay? And ultimately our capacity planning objective is to balance resource requirements with resource availability. So in, in terms of time per unit um, as well as time available per resource we want, and production volume, we want to balance those things. Let's talk specifically about routes. Okay? Route is a um, series of operations where, where an operation is a step in the production process. Okay? And typically when we set up a route, 
Um, that includes the resources and the time required to complete that step. Production routes typically consist of multiple operations, and we're going we're to look at a fairly simple one for our example here. Um, when we talk about the times used that are specified in the routing, and we'll, we'll look at a picture of this as well, we've got some times that are used that are going to consume capacity um, and are also going to impact our schedule for when we think we can run production. We've got other times that we may put in the route, buffer times that are used for purposes of scheduling, but we may or may not, I'd say more typically not, um, actually consume capacity with those. So the, the primary times that we're going to look at for capacity planning are, mis are setup time, which is a time required to prepare a resource to perform a specific operation. Um, it typically, machine change, tooling setup, um, work center prep, things of that nature. And that's typically expressed as a fixed amount of time um, per production job. Right? So if I'm going to run uh, an assembly operation, I need some type of tooling at a work center, I have a setup involved with getting that tooling there. Once the tooling is there, I'm really concerned with now how much does it time, how much process does it time, process time does it take, how much time does it take to, for me to assemble each one of those units. And so that's typically um, expressed as a variable time per some specified quantity. Okay. Um, the other times that we consider, and again, I kind of left these out of the capacity equation for our purposes here, although we, there, there are exceptions where we may want to include them. Um, queue time, which is the expected wait time either before an operation starts or after an operation completes, and move time, the expected transport time to move materials between process operations. Uh, move time could be significant, particularly in cases where you've got to move uh, material to a different facility for the next operation, or if you've got a subcontract step in there for you send something out for painting or heat treating or something of that nature. You've got, uh, in, in some cases, significant transport time that you may want to build into the schedule but again, that may not be a capacity consuming function. Okay, So let's look at a picture of this. So on the left side here, I've got my parts and raw material. And let's just assume that we're making our finished good one product here. On the right side, I've got my completed end item, my completed finished good one. And in the middle is everything that's represented by the production route. So you know, do I want to allow for time to queue, uh, move material? Do I want have some time for material prep that I want to wait on the prior uh, to the beginning of my first operation. Um, the first operation would be my assembly work center where I say I've got one hour of setup, one hour to prepare my tooling, and then two hours of process time per unit, meaning I've got for every one I'm going to assemble, it's going to take me two hours to do it. I may have some queue and move in between, and then I've got a testing and inspection work center where I've got no setup time specified on this one, and I've got one hour of process time, in this case, per 12 units that I'm going to produce. Then I may have some additional queue and move on the back end of that, and then ultimately my completed item. Okay, so again, kind of a simple depiction of a, of a two-step route. And here's how we would represent that in AX. Just I'm, I'm going to focus primarily on the capacity functions here for for purposes of this example. So I've got a route for my product FG1. Um, I've got two steps, uh, an assembly step and a testing step. My assembly step is set up with an hour of setup and two hours of runtime per process quantity of one, so two hours per unit. Um, my testing step has no setup, and my runtime is set up as one hour per 12 units that I'm going to run. I could specify that as five minutes if I want to, but for just for illustration here, I said one hour per some specified quantity. Okay. Now let's assume, so in this case I put production in the schedule and I put a production order of 16 units out there and I scheduled it for a time in mid-May. And let's look at what that does from a capacity standpoint. So in the capacity column for this first, uh, uh, first production resource, the one that I've called uh, assembly, I've got eight hours of capacity available on that resource each day. Um, I'm going to produce 16 of these units, which, is, which I know is going to take two hours per unit to produce, so that's 32 hours of run, and I've got an additional one hour of setup in there, so I've got a total of 33 hours of load that I need to figure out how to schedule across a resource that has eight hours a day of available capacity. So in my scheduling example, it took that 33 hours, and when I scheduled it, it placed um, those operations across the days that were available based on the capacity that was available to me on that resource. 
I can also look at a graphical view of the same thing where I look at my blue bar being the capacity and the orange bar being my production load on that resource as well. So again, what I define in my route, the times I specify in my route, and the hours of capacity that I specify as available on my production resource will be netted against each other to determine what my capacity requirements are and what my viable uh, scheduling plan is for that resource. Okay? So that's kind of a quick overview of the mechanics of the way distribution planning works, capacity planning works, and material requirement planning works. I want to throw a couple variables into the equation now just to, you know, just to get some sense for um, modifiers that may impact our schedule. So far we've gone with a fairly simple model where I've got a stocking plan of one in each case. But in reality, we're always going to have other inventory policies rules or decisions that are used to set some of those parameters that drive our master scheduling that are going to influence our plan. The ERP system typically doesn't dictate these policies, but certainly the results are going to be constrained or modified based on the policies that we set. So what is my stocking plan? What materials do I want to stock where and in what quantities? How frequently do I want to replenish? So be it buying raw material, you know, producing manufactured material or transferring out to each of these sites? Is there a frequency with which I want to run those replenishments? Um, and do I have standard lot sizes or any constraints that I want to consider when procuring, producing, or transferring? Some supplier imposed constraints on minimum orders. Um, some logistical constraints on, um, you know, might, might limit maximum order size based on full truckload size or based on warehouse storage capability or based on machine uh, tank size if I'm running a mixing operation. So things of that nature. And again, then again, critically, what lead time will be used when planning for each item. Okay. Ultimately, our inventory policies attempt to balance inventory investment and customer service level. And with inventory investment, I'd also say there's a balance of efficiency in there as well. Okay. Um, so to, to just, these are some standard APEX terms. I want to talk a little bit about the types of things that will influence some of those policies. So I've got really four different production methods that we work with. An engineer to order, which is a you know, custom production. Make to order, which is perhaps a standard product design, but produced per customer request. Um, assemble to order, which is you know, a standard or configurable product that's made from stock materials and components for quick assembly. Um, and then lastly, make the stock product, which is inventory finished goods that we want available for immediate shipment. Um, a given production facility may have products that fall across multiple and even all of those categories. Um, one note I want to make on configurable products, you know, uh, and just a quick example of this, configurable products are typically uh, used to support a postponement or or mass customization strategy. Uh, a Dell model is a great example of that. When you used to order all your Dell computers online, they didn't stock any finished goods, um, but you could mix and match any number of different features. So their planning method planned for all those sub-assemblies, which they quickly snapped together um, to, to make a customizable product. So it allows a degree of customization without you know, full, full engineering. Um, requirement. Just a quick view uh, at lead time. So what's significant about the production environment is how they align to customer lead time expectations. So typically in an engineer to order environment, we're going to have a longer lead time view, um, and that's going to become shorter as we move all the way to make the stock. Okay. So let's look at a uh, couple quick things here. Um, the coverage types in AX, right? So we can. So one of the things that we'll define is when we want to replenish. How do we want to replenish? On a lot per lot basis, um, do we want to maintain a minimum stocking level and replenish up to a max stocking level? Do we want to replenish based on some order interval or time period of supply? Um, the other things that will influence our order defaults, which will be our formula multiples, order multiples, minimums, maximums, and standard order quantities. So I'm taking my same um, FG1, and now I've added variables to it. So um, the first thing we'll see is that the production site is the same. Right? I've got no minimum that I'm maintaining in the production site, and I'm going to cover all production requirements uh, on a requirement basis, a lot for lot basis. In my distribution centers, I'm using a minimum stocking principle, so I've got a minimum order point, and I'm using a coverage um, setup based on an order interval of seven days. In other words, any time that I replenish to a distribution center, I want to make sure I cover seven days worth of demand. 
Um, in the distribution centers, maybe I'm not projecting demand, so I want to set up replenishment out at the distribution centers based on a minimum maximum principle. And I've got various mins and maxes set for the for the different DCs. Okay. Um, order defaults are, are another variable that we have in there. And I've set order defaults for three of my sites, for my manufacturing sites and my first two DCs. And all of these all of these uh, defaults have to do with minimum quantities. And, uh, and order multiples. So in my production side, I'm always going to run at least 32. Maybe that's a pallet quantity. And I'm always going to run in multiples of full pallet. Um, from a distribution standpoint, I work with smaller multiples. And in those these cases, I've also got max quantities there. And because it's a DC, let's say, for example, that max is driven by the amount of storage space I've got allocated to this particular product. Okay, so when I look at the planned order picture for distribution orders now with those modifiers, I see a few different things, right? So my, where, my satellite warehouse orders are driven now by those mins and maxes that I set in the system. My distribution orders are driven also by mins, um, but as well by the demand that's being, projected demand that's being pulled from the DCs, and I've also imposed some minimums and multiples in those cases, and my planned production order is now um, 32 units to support requirements that are out in the, that are being driven by the two DCs. Okay, um, last topic that I want, want to look at quickly is demand management. And I'm sorry I'm going through this kind of kind of quickly, but just I want to get make sure we get a good overview of all these topics. Um, in this case, I've added somewhat to the equation by projecting some demand for these items. And in this case, I'm forecasting at the DC level. I could forecast at any level. Uh, manufacturing site, distribution site, if you didn't forecast at the satellite warehouse site. In this case, I've decided I want to forecast at the distribution center level. And so I put some forecast data in there for June, for July, and for August for both my DC1 and my DC2. So if I come back and based on that forecast data, look at the planned activity that's in place, you can see that I've got um, now projected demand. I've got orders that I need to, re that, that I need to replenish in June to meet June demand, July demand, and August demand in the two DCs, um, in addition to the demand that I need to replenish their minimum stocking levels um, right away today. And if I look, look down at the lower half of that pane, I see a number of planned production orders um, in increased quantities for to begin in May to support June demand, to begin in June to support July demand, and to begin in July to support August demand. Right, so where I started with, uh, you know, sort of a simple mechanical model where I was just looking to fill the distribution network with one each, um, as I add things like order policy and as I add things like demand to the equation, we can begin to see um, the, the potential for planning over a longer range. Um, we're not going to look at it, but again, if I took these planned production orders and ran those down through a material requirements calculation, I would see dependent component requirements to support each of those production orders there as well. Okay, so in summary, and the key takeaways from today is, is, just, is primarily to understand the, the process scope of master planning in the AX module. So it's capabilities for calculating distribution requirements, material requirements, and capacity requirements. Um, a look at some of the planning variables. Certainly, you know, there's some room to go into deeper discussion on all of these things. Uh, but some of the planning variables for um, managing the replenishment um, of a particular item in each location where it's stocked or produced. Um, and then lastly, some of the demand projections that roll through the distribution network, through uh, the manufacturing requirements to calculate raw material requirements as well.